over everything, y'all. We taking it back. Welcome to this season 12 episode of Left to Black, and we are honored to have Professor Jessica Marie Johnson join us, Assistant Professor in the Department of History at Johns Hopkins University. Um, she also directs Life X Codes, Digital Humanities Against Enclosure, and is a co-curator of Electric Marinage with Yamada Figueroa a historian of the of Atlantic slavery and the Atlantic African diaspora. Johnson is the author of Wicked Flesh, Black Women, Intimacy and Freedom in the Atlantic World, which was published by the University of Pennsylvania Press in 2020. The book has since won the Wesley Logan Prize in African Diaspora History granted by the American Historical Association. It has also won the 2020 Kemper and Leela Williams Prize for Louisiana History granted by the Historic New Orleans Collection and the Louisiana Historical Association. And it has also just won the Laura Romero First Book Prize granted by the American Association, American Studies Association. Previous winners of the Romero Prize include our friend Ruthie Gilmore, Sarah Haley, Simone Brown, uh, and the just announced MacArthur Fellow, uh, Nicole Fleetwood. Of Wicked Flesh, noted historian Jennifer Morgan writes, Wicked Flesh is a powerful book that will set the standard for studies of gender and slavery to follow. It exemplifies the generative quality of a grounded engagement of the archives of slavery through contemporary theoretical work on race, and the notion of diaspora. How are you doing today, Professor Johnson? Doing well, thank you so much for having me, Professor Neal. So this is a, a return visit for you, but I believe this is the first time um, you're appearing on Left of Black Solo, um, having previously appeared with uh, Howard Ransby too, uh, and, and also our good friend, uh, Trevor Blaine Lindsay. So we're honored to have you back and obviously honored to talk about this incredible impactful book that is so beautifully and lovingly written. Um, and, and I want to start there because um, I want to get a sense of your travels to Wicked Flesh. You know, it, it doesn't strike me as the kind of book that is simply the byproduct of, of, of a graduate student sitting in graduate classes reading across boundaries, right? It, it, it seems more personal even as it's talking about, you know, the lives of black women in, in the 18th century, um, it seems more personal than just your, your organic reading process of reading across boundaries. Um, I am, um, I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> um, one of the, um, you know, so, so Wicked Flesh is absolutely, of course, based on um, or derived from my dissertation. Um, and I absolutely want to shout out um, Tyra Berlin, who has since passed, um, but was my advisor at University of Maryland, as well as um, Elsa Berkeley Brown, Aileen Bowles, Hillary Jones, and uh, Psyche William Forson. Um, Elsa in particular, who was um, a really a, a true and uh, loving mentor um, there uh, while I was there, and just a phenomenal historian, Black woman historian. Um, so, it, you know, the, the, the nitty gritty of the research and the, the focus and the interest in bringing a kind of comparative framework to this history of the 18th century, this history of the French Atlantic, this history of, of, of New Orleans, but so much more than that, uh, is very much, um, very much part Part of the research that I did uh, as a graduate student and for my dissertation. Um, but Wicked Flesh is a very different book. Um, it is a book that in some ways wrote me, <laughs> wrote itself, <laughs> um, uh, definitely took hold of, of, of me in the research as well as the writing um, and decided what it wanted to be. Uh, and, um, and from a a research project that was incredibly empirical and very much about um, empire and the apparatus of empire, French colonial empire in particular. Um, the women, um, the African women and women of African descent um, in the archive and, and in the research, um, you know, took hold of, of, of this text and decided that this is what they wanted to make of it. <laughs> um, and so in a lot of ways it is, um, 
it is very much a conversation. Um, and I and I worked hard. I hope that comes through. I worked hard to try and make what is still essentially an academic book, very much a conversation um, with um, enslaved and free women of African descent in the archive, um, with the ways that they show up um, in in all of their complicated um, complicated dynamics, um, and in their defiance, um, and in the losses that they have, and in the violence that's engaged upon them, um, make it a conversation with them and what they um, wanted to tell about what is this experience of slavery. And what is the experience of a world in which slavery is still very much in formation? Uh, and how do we understand African women and women African descent as part of that conversation, as part of that battle over what wow. slavery, blackness, and even freedom, um, freedom would become? So, um, so yeah. So oh, I owe very much. Uh, I owe so much to um, to them really as well, black women um, in the archive. You know what's fascinating about about the book is that, you know, th this is a book that is finding bodies and spirits and relationships in the archive in ways that the archive doesn't normally show up. Um, you know, it's, it, it, you know, you were not finding these, you know, as we've talked about before, you, you weren't finding them in bins, <laughs> in boxes. Um, your, your entry port, your portal into this archive is really you know, kinship and, and intimacy and, and talk a little bit as a historian, how do you both quantify and, and qualify, you know, what intimacy looks like in, in an archive? Yeah, so, um, you know, there's a couple, so there's a couple things there. One is that, um, and this is this has changed. Uh, uh, this has changed since uh, first started, you know, ending um, uh, the dissertation, and 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 then you know now in the present day, and when so much of the conversation around archives and and how to find the archives is is really deeply enriched by folks who are doing um, critical, essentially critical Black Studies work in the archive and in mm -hmm. thinking about archives and finding aids. Um, so a lot of this has changed, but it is still the case that how we enter into the brick and mortar archive and the boxes and the folios and the, the manuscripts and the, the microfilm is still so much structured by um, questions of, 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 of provenance, of organization, of cataloging that just are not meant for Black life, period, across the board. Um, and I just wanna, um, Dorothy Berry has a fantastic essay on this and thinking about some of the you know, basic principles of archival science are themselves the same principles that make um, Black folks illegible um, and make them hard to find. Like it's hard to actually find the box <laughs> in the actual archive in the building, um, much less than, you know, encounter documents in which, you know, essentially you're speaking, um, it's, it's slave owners who are writing their own history. It's, um, it's European, um, overwhelmingly men, but, you know, there are um, European women also scattered throughout there who are telling the story of slavery or telling the story of the rise of um, colonization and, and what is to be done with the quote unquote savages or what is to be done with the quote unquote um, 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 Nick. Um, and all these kind of questions. And so, you know, you encounter those and somewhere in there you have to find the mentions of, of women, of girls, of, of, of femininity, of practices of, uh, that do not look like the practices of enslavement and colonization and, and genocide. Um, and that's an incredible amount of work. And I wanna really kind of foreground that. Um, I also, um, you know, know that there is, there is also different ways that that work shows up depending on different archives. So I also want to, um, you know, make space for the ways that uh, material testimony appears um, in different ways in, in a francophone archive than it might in um, the English speaking archive than it might in the Spanish speaking archive. Um, and so there are actually all ways that places like um, Gulf Coast, Louisiana, or also in, in a really interesting parallel that we don't talk about enough, places like Senegambia, which has mm -hmm. archives that are in, in um, Portuguese, Dutch, as well as 
it, um, UK um, and French archives of the same, you know, 18th, 17th century, 18th century dynamic, these are also, these overlapping empires offer opportunities both in the moment for African women, like I said, to speak to the different possibilities and play imperial assumptions against each other and um, take advantage of institutions like the notary or like the um, baptismal font um, that then, you know, passed down to us. And so then we then also um, get opportunities to hear testimony in New Orleans editorial records that we would not be able to hear in, say, South Carolina's judicial documents. Um, and so I want to also like, you know, you know, you know, press on that and that there is so um, there's a lot that is um, that we cannot know, but there's also there are actually also is a lot that we can know and that we're, we also, especially for graduate students who are listening or scholars who are interested in researching, um, there is also a lot actually that is that is also there. Um, and how do we put those? How do we how do we knit those together? Um, uh, and even and yet still because there's a lot of and also, I like to like not live in binaries. Um, there's always a lot of and also. There is also the, the reality that um, engaging intimacy, engaging kinship can sometimes be easier because kinship is a thing that gets recorded by slave owners right. and colonial right. officials because right. it's it's economic, right? Like it's a market, it's a it's a commodity. Of the extent to which enslaved women are um, are are reproducing, that's a market dynamic, which means that it's something that may factor into and get recorded in archives. Kinship from that, because that's not necessarily kinship, <laughs> reproducing is necessarily kinship, but kinship from that, you know, can then also appear in some interesting ways and forms and um, enslaved women who are, you know, fighting for their children, who are aborting children, who are caught in infanticide cases, like the whole range, all of those are reverberations of kinship. So kinship sometimes appears more readily than intimacy. Um, intimacy is, is, is twofold for me, on the one hand, there is how do we um, how do we define it? How do we encounter it? Like, what exactly are we looking for when we're talking about intimacy and slavery's archive? Are we talking about sex acts? Are we talking about physical proximity? Are we talking about the kinds of um, proximity that is, in particular, corporeal um, um, of of a particular duration? Um, involves um, so one of my definitions, along with those, is you know what it involves an exchange of fluids. So there's there's certainly sex acts, but then there's also nurse in which you are essentially taking care of someone, um, dealing with blood, with, with, with urine, with all of the kinds of fluids that come with, you know, the physical aspects of healthcare. Um, you know, like, so what, like, so what are the kind of constituent elements of, of intimacy and how do we, um, and how do we sort of, you know, then take a broader picture to look at that and the, um, and the, the social, economic and effective manifestations of that. And then where you, when you begin to look at that in slavery's archive, you see, you see black women, period. You know, you see a lot of things. You see um, a lot, you see black men as well, but you see black women, they are at the intersection of intimacy and kinship um, and bondage. Um, and they are also finding ways to innovate on that and create with that and fight with that. Um, that uh, that we're still excavating as as practices of freedom um, that we can that we can draw on today. Your book is in conversation with you know a generation of books and and scholars. I'm thinking most prominently, obviously, Saida Hartman, but also someone like uh, Marissa Fuentes, um, that are redefining for us how we find victories in the archive. Um, you know, to 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 to, to really take as important gestures even that typically have been dismissed when we look for other kinds of official victories, if you will. Um, but they also are books that capture like Wicked Flesh, the, the trauma that, that's in the archive. And, and for you as an archivist, as a historian, um, how do you balance the trauma that lives in these archives and, and you know to not be fully engulfed by that trauma as you're writing these narratives yeah um this is you know this is always the question right you know like how do we um how do we deal um how do we deal with what is 
been the past experiences um, that we're encountering um, and that we know are just are there are, are, are part of our history uh, and how do we um, and how do we deal with um, the ramifications of that um, I think that there are so many ways that the history of slavery um, at the experience of slavery, because it's not just like history, it's also like those who are engaged in slavery studies, right? Um, who are engaged in like that deep thought and a deep reflection with what is what is bondage, like what is the nature of bondage and what is the nature of Black life in these earlier periods. Um, I think for, for, to, for me, engaging in that means that I am um, absolutely looking for um, and engage with the ways that um, life is, is, is devastating in some fundamental ways, um, in some truly terrible ways. Um, and that t- tells me that if I am still here, <laughs> if we are still here making and creating and innovating and engaged in all of the aesthetic and social and political practices that demand something more, some world otherwise, some other kind of freedom from this world, from this planet, um, and, and <laughs> that there is something that I, um, I want to learn from how and where life appears within that devastation, how and where our humanity continues to be fought for, grappled with, redefined, revised, affirmed, um, even in the midst of, of the darkest nights. Um, as a quote that I come back to a lot, and I'm gonna get it wrong, because um, I always have to look it up to get it exactly right. There's a quote that Clyde Wood has um, about learning from the South, learning from the Black South, learning from New Orleans and Louisiana, the Delta South, um, and learning from that organizing that happens um, in the in the Gulf Coast and in the Delta, what it means to continue to have hope even in the darkest times, and I think that that's also um, that's also a, a something that I um, I try and put in practice, and it's also what draws me again and again to the study of 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 slavery and being in slavery's archive. That w- there is a search here for me of what are have the practices of freedom have been, both to you know narrate them of that moment because I think that's important in how we were continue to revise that history so that we continue to see more and more clearly Black life and humanity in that moment. Um, is is incredibly important, but it's also about what those practices of freedom actually mean to us in the present day and how do we use them and and innovate on them here? How do we appreciate the ways that um, whether it's the reproductive control that is infanticide or whether it's the aesthetic practices of the Tignon, whether it's the gathering spaces, the the project of a feast day, like all of those, those are practices that we continue to use and we continue to need to come back to as something really fundamental in our in our freedom gaining and in, in our in our in our organizing so that's what continues to, to draw me to draw me back over and um, over and over okay. one of my favorite passages in the book um, you write about wicked flesh it is a history practicing the same murky contingent and fluid freedom the women under study experience in their everyday lives in an effort to circumvent an archive of disappearing bodies, limited detail, and excessive violence. Um, unpack that for our audience. Yeah, so one of the things I really wanted to do if I was going to grapple with slavery and freedom and that binary, if I was going to make it focused on um, Black women um, in, a, in a gender expansive sense, um, Black women, Black feminists, Black femininity. Um, what I also wanted to do, because I find it to be a really critical, um, I, we find it to be of critical importance when we're engaging this archive um, and we're engaging the past and particularly Black experiences. I think it counts across the board, the Black experiences. Um, What I really wanted to do was make sure that I was holding space for all of the possibilities, Um, Mm -hmm. that I'm not going into um, an understanding of these women's lives with the presumption that there is some kind of um, freedom that they should have been fighting for um, that is defined as X, that is not actually 
um, you know, reverberating up through their lived experiences and the reality of what they actually did <laughs> in order to like create space and autonomy and safety in their lives. I wanted to make sure that I was not um, coming to um, the archive or this history with an assumption of what I thought freedom was, um, what I thought liberation was or should be, what I thought the proper um, behavior towards resistance or revolution is or should be. Um, I wanted to understand what their experience of bondage and therefore freedom was on their terms. And that means that it is murky. That means that people are making decisions and those decisions now 200, 300, 400 years later, those don't look like safe decisions. They don't look like decisions that are made with care. They don't like to look like decisions that are made for the whole black community, for the whole black right. womanhood community. Um, they, you know, like that, that's, that's true. Um, you have women slave owners. Um, you have um, a women who are securing freedom on the backs of others who are, um, you have free women of color who are fighting amongst each other, um, you know, over the inheritances and the, the, the property left behind, you know, and subjecting the, the children of, uh, you know, their nieces and nephews to all kinds of things. Um, it's not, you know, the idea is not, for me, the idea is not to catalog behavior as good or bad behavior or as radical as more radical, um, because I actually don't think we know <laughs> yeah, that from right. this vantage point. I don't think we can appreciate that from this vantage point. Um, and I think, you know, like, I think that there's the only way to, to do that is to, A, just know what was going on, what were the stakes, um, and learn from that. So, um, if something, if, if, in, if I keep coming back to infanticide for some reason, but if, um, if battling, if taking another freedom of color to court is your only option, okay, what has been set up to make that the only possibility of your survival? Right. And that's what I want to know about. And for me, it's, it's, um, it's of course not like putting, you know, something, my presumptions of what liberation is into the past, but it's also about, um, and I want to draw on Dr. Jamada Figueroa's practice um, and, and theorization of faithful witnessing. It's also about a faithful witnessing of, of, of trusting that the African women and women African descent in their moment are doing the best they can. And I may not like it in this present moment. It may not be in my head. I might not be like, oh, I wouldn't do that. All of that is beside the point. If what we're trying to do is trust black women and really take mm, that seriously, mm, mm. <laughs> you know, we say that it's a cute slogan, but are we really taking that seriously? If I'm really taking that seriously, then that means that I need to understand this world on their terms. And that means that those are the kinds of questions I have to ask. Yeah. I need to know, yes, who is owning other enslaved women? I also need to know what are the conditions that made that the only decision possible or one of an array of decisions that this woman decided to make. And it turns out free, free African women in Senegal are owning enslaved women or are you know, operating them as property. And they also themselves are subject and beholden to patriarchal structures in which they can be killed and are killed and raped with impunity as well. So there's a lot also to learn um, in a relational way. Um, and a and in a densely like you know contextual way about how people are are, are living and what that means um, and what that means for them and it means also I'm thinking with Imani Perry's work that we actually for me it's it's also about knowing who the real enemy is so for me the enemy is not a free African woman who owns enslaved people that's not who I'm fighting I'm fighting you know what is the conditions that make that a, a, a condition of possibility. Right. in the historical context and in her life. Um, and so that's what I, that's what I'm, I'm trying to work, sure. work with and through. So it's murky, it's really messy and really complicated. Um, and it also means that, and the last thing I'll say, um, it also means that the way we think about freedom then has to be as murky and complicated. It can't right. be freedom is the Manumission Act and freedom is the Emancipation Decree. It has to be, what are these other moments of freedom that are happening that um, these women are also saying, this is what freedom is to me. And I'm going to make it even if it's just a moment. So. Yeah. I want to shift gears a little bit. Um, you, in some ways, as a, as a scholar, you know, you're a bit of, of a unicorn in the sense that you, you, you clearly work in the past. <laughs> um, 
you you write and you research and and your activism speaks to this moment, right? But you're also doing work that is tremendously of a future <laughs> that we're still trying to figure out. And and of course, that space is is a digital humanities space. Um, in which you have emerged over the last five, six years, even longer, as one of the most important voices in that relationship between digital humanities and Black studies, and, and definitely among Black women who are, who are working in that space. Um, talk a little bit about what it's like for you as a scholar to shift gears, um, or even if you see it as a shifting gear, right? It, it, it's, is the work you do in DH an extension of the work that you do around Black Atlantic slavery? Um, or is, you know, or, or vice versa, right? How do they feed into each other? In what ways are they kind of separate and distinct? Yeah, this is a good, um, this is a good question. And, and as you know, I've often described myself as somebody who is, you know, you can catch me in, you know, scholarship before emancipation, pretty much anywhere where there's, you know, Atlantic slavery, and then you can pick me back up in 2000. <laughs> Like I will skip the 20th century. I am not a 20th century scholar. I do not know how y'all are dealing with lynchings and genocide, like 20th century genocides. Right. Like that is, no, mm -mm, no, I will. I have got enough blood and gore in my world. I'm good. Um, <laughs> so, um, so yeah, so, so it's funny because I, you know, I, I think that one of the reasons I am so attracted to, um, so my route through and into digital humanities is through um, digital media, radical media, social media, um, and the ways that um, what I've described in other places um, is as black digital practice. So not the DH that is out of the academy or the, the digital media that is like, you know, the big um, right. corporate media magnets, which, you know, there was a time where there was not a, you know, CNN.com and a HuffPost right. live. Like there is a, <laughs> people read to read newspapers just paper newspapers that was right. a moment and so all of this has occurred essentially in my you know scholarly lifetime mm -hmm. um and so um and so i'm not you know those are not necessarily my 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 um where i hone in my interests um i'm especially interested in how um communities um how um how grassroots organizers um and families individuals are innovating digital practice um particularly those who are interested in um, um these days i'm especially interested in those who are doing um, black family histories black cultural histories and i'm especially interested in in folks who are thinking about and thinking with um computational practices um, but i'm interested in the quotidian i'm interested in yeah, black digital right. practice on a kind of everyday level um, and so for me it actually is very very um, analogous to the work i do with slavery because it's similar like i'm interested in the quotidian when it comes to slavery's archive as well as well the histories of slavery i'm interested in what are the kind of everyday um, relations that people are having? What are the everyday experiences that people are having? How do those, um, you know, how do we understand those and understand those as scaffolding to, you know, something like the Civil War, which, you know, the boys describe as a general strike. Um, Stephen Hahn describes the North as the largest maroon colony in the United States during the 18th, so starting essentially in the 1840s, 1850s, 1860s. So how do we understand, Stephanie Camp talks about the mass migration from plantations as actually a product of a longer practice of truancy, which creates a rival geography that makes that geographic knowledge possible. So how do we talk about, you know, how we talk about the quotidian as actually like the kind of the data, the like the, the lowest common denominator of what becomes a movement, what becomes revolution, what becomes uh, the, the large scale slave revolt. All of that feels very similar to um, what you can witness in the practices of engagement with digital media and social media. So whether it's, um, you know, people, you know, using hashtags in order to index movement and movement making. And um, there's uh, the amazing book, Hashtag Activism, which is out now, Sarah Jackson, mm -hmm. Brooke Cole Wells, and Moya mm -hmm. Bailey, mm -hmm. or whether it's folks who are using um, um, digital tools and platforms in order to um, create nodes of connection, to organize, to, to share information, all of those things. Now, a lot of that has changed since I first began engaging um, with digital media 
um, and in doing um, blogging and engaging a radical woman of color um, in, in, uh, media production um, online. Um, and so, you know, it's worth thinking about, and this is um, a lot of the, the new projects, we're thinking about what does that look like um, in the present day of, mm. you know, this 2020s moment, post COVID moment, where now everything is essentially digital. Um, but I think at the root of it for me, even as it's changed and even, even as there are new questions to be asked, um, I always come back to well, what does this everyday look like? And what does everyday look like when it's a practice of, of joy as well as revolt, right? Um, Andre Brock has amazing work around Black um, uh, social media practice as, an, as the joyfulness, the, the whimsicalness um, as actually part of, um, as part of a Black politic. Um, yeah. You know, how do we take that seriously? And and those two feel feel actually very similar. Um, so another way to think about it for me is the, the digital landscape lets us see what we should actually be looking for in slavery's archives. So it just lets us see what's always been there. It's not necessarily creating new things. Black folks have always been lit on TikTok and you know doing verses and whatever else. It's just that the technology lets us see it in a new way. Um, and that, that, that feels very similar to, to when I'm looking for things in, you know, in these boxes mm -hmm. and, and manuscripts. Uh, if you had to offer an assessment of where Black studies is in 2021 as a digital practice, <laughs> what would your assessment be? Black studies in the academy? It, Black studies Black in the studies. academy. Black studies in the academy as a digital practice. <laughs> hmm. I would say that Black studies in the academy as a digital practice today is in a very interesting moment. Um, on the one hand, you have, um, I feel like I've seen more conversation, more rich critical engagement, more publications in hmm. Black studies um, just the, the books that are coming out are just, there are so many. Right. <laughs> like I was it's, it's hard to I, keep I, track. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it, and it's tweeting the other day. I was like, so I'm afraid that actually I may not get to all of these books and be able to do like the deep right. conscientious reading that I like to do before, you know, my time on this planet has passed because there's so much amazing work and you just want to read it over and over. So there's a particular moment. In, and I think the, the, the digital is very part of that. Um, and we saw this, again, seeing things, seeing things that are already there. We saw this with, with COVID where people can't go out to book talks, they can't organize events, but there's podcasts, there are, um, there are video clips, there's the use of social media. There've been so many Instagram lives. Aswad has hosted Instagram lives with new books and books in progress um, throughout COVID. There is, um, there's Facebook lives and Facebook events. There is a way of being able to reach out and be in conversation with Black Studies scholars in ways that you know, I don't remember being the case when, um, right. when yeah. I was a graduate right. student. And so right. therefore, it, it is a different kind of access. Um, and I think that that's incredibly powerful. So, um, so in the kind of digital realm, there are more places to create media and to create content. And a, that means a conversation that was once you know, if briefly, because Black Studies is very much rooted in the people and the folk and organizing. Mm -hmm. But if there was a moment where Black Studies was kind of ensconced in the academy and and then closed there, um, it's clear that that is right. is yeah. is getting poked hole, getting holes poked in it now, right? Um, so there's that. But on the other side, I also think that Black Studies in the academy is also being confronted with uh, again a broader Black public that has its own ideas about what Black life and thought is or should be. Um, and so it will be on Black Studies scholars in the academy to return again and again to, to what the are people. the principles of our work? Yeah. What are the ways that we're in conversation, not antagonistic to the folk, to the people, to the communities that we're accountable to? And what are the ways and what does that mean for our scholarship? Like, how are we also being changed by pushing our work out of um, the rules of the academic um, um, rubrics and criteria, how are we also being changed by that? What does that mean yeah. that, that um, our interdisciplinary methods have to do in order to be accountable to what, um, what our communities are demanding of the work? And I think that that's, that seems to be increasing where we're at. And, um, and I hope we approach it with generosity and with a willingness to be changed by the work 
um, because I think that could mean so many amazing things for where the thought goes in the in the near future. I mean, you said something there that's, that's really fascinating, and I really hadn't thought about Black studies in this way before until you just said it, but to think of Black studies as an enclosure at the university, uh, in the academy, um, and, and what we're witnessing now is this dispersion of Black knowledge, right, but also a dispersion of Black expertise, and, 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 and Black academics and scholars, I, I don't, you know, I, I'll be honest, right? I, I don't know how I feel about Questlove writing a book about the history of the last 50 years of Black music, right? Right, that's right, <laughs> um, that's right. I, you know, right. And, 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 and to have so many folks know and read and see uh, Questlove, but have no idea who Eileen Southern is, right? For which the very basis of Black musical studies, right, is, is founded. Um, and, and so it, it does, I, I like the idea of thinking about it in terms of generosity, right? And, and remembering black, black studies as being founded, not as an enclosure at the university, right? Or, or on the college campus, right? But as something that literally came from the streets into the academy with the hope that there will always be a portal going back and forth between the streets and, and the academy. That's right. That's right. That's right. Absolutely. I mean, I think that, and the other side of that, of course, is that the academy has has never really been the only place where Black studies happens, but increasingly because of what has happened to universities, university positions and jobs, the increase of um, um, of, of fixed term and, and adjunct labor, um, the different ways, uh, the expansion of other kinds of positions at, at, at universities, uh, the administrative expansion, um, like all of that has shifted what is possible as far as even just being employed within the university. So that means that for those who want to do and are invested in, are called to, because it is a calling, Black thought and Black scholarship and Black study, we're not going to not do it. But if I can't get an academic job, I'm still going to do it. I'm just going to do it over here. I'm going to do it over here. And so how are we in community with the folk, who, the person, the research center at the nonprofit, um, the um, the community organizer who is hosting workshops, the artist who is has a you know is at you know um, at a gallery or or the curator at the gallery. How are we in community all together, yeah. as well as with those who are you know gathering around the kitchen table, um, you know at the barbershop, at the beauty shop? Like how are we all you know understanding um, ourselves in the same project? Um, and that doesn't mean that there is not an appreciation of expertise. I absolutely think that that is critical and that there is, you know, like that skill and that the, the discipline of coming again and again to the work, those who do have that discipline and have the space to have that, um, that, that, that that's really important. But, you know, I want to be in community with everybody, you know, like I don't want us to be, you know, fighting each other for the crumbs of what the university gives us. Um, and I do want, you know, I want us, and I do want to approach you know, in the same way that I want to approach the women in, in the archive with that kind of faithful witnessing, I want to approach um, approach those of us invested in in Black study and Black scholarship with the with the same practice. So um, it's difficult because I think that also the 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 kind of um, metaphysical you know investment in Black study and Black thought is also often layered on labor issues and or university labor issues and those aren't necessarily the same. So the labor issue of, of offering folks and find, giving folks space to be able to have the time of a day to be able to just read a book like that's a labor issue, <laughs> you know, that for me, that's like, okay, so how do we have more spaces where folks can just, you know, have the time of the day to read a book so they can get their guild up, right? Like they can get their, their weight up. Um, that's not an issue of, oh, well, they weren't, you know, they weren't in the academy, so therefore somehow their work is, is less legitimate. Um, and it's a, yeah, it's a lot to, to balance, but again, you know, I, I'm constantly coming back to Monty Perry and she says it's a vexy thing just so I have, um, I can put out the reference, you know, who is, who is the real enemy here? And, um, and I think we need to keep that in mind. We've been joined today by Professor Jessica Marie Johnson, assistant professor in the Department of History at the Johns Hopkins University. She also directs LifeX Code, Digital Humanities Against Enclosure, is a co-curator with Yomada Figueroa of Electric Marinage. We've been talking today mostly about her award-winning book, Wicked Flesh, 
Black Women, Intimacy and Freedom in the Atlantic World, published by the University of Pennsylvania Press, August 2020. As always, it is a joy to interlock with you, <laughs> Professor Johnson. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. Always a pleasure. <laughs> black lights and booms burn when I record for Watts. And every black like Troy Davis who never had a fair shot. All black everything. Everything black. Culture over everything, y'all. We take it.